The Tolkien Road, Episode 96, The Lord of the Rings, The Voice of Saruman. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 3, Chapter 10, The Voice of Saruman. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Or you can stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello everybody, welcome to the Tolkien Road Podcast, episode 97, John here, and Greta, you're here too. Hey, hey. I am here. What's yeah, up? Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Um, Are you on Pinterest or something? No, just, you know, making sure I got all our correspondence uh, in order, don't so want to miss anything. Doing your job, just doing my job. Just doing my I'm job. I'm working That's here. right. I'm working here. Double tasking. That's right. We women are good at that kind of thing. Mul- mul- Wait, is this episode 97 or episode 96? 96. 96, okay. Yep. A little, got a little, a super fan, Josh. I got a little there ahead of myself there. Noted in the, an email to me yesterday. He said the hundredth episode approaches. It does. It we appro- gotta do in fact, awesome. It not only approaches, it approacheth. Right. Yes, approacheth. Yeah. If you speak in the uh, olden olden times English, it sounds a little more ominous. It does approacheth. That's right. Yeah. Would you have to something, do something? Something wicked this way comes. Oh. Yes. Tragedy on the River Ohio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Episode yeah, so episode one hundred. You know, I have to say again, it's like I I've kind of him and hawed about whether it's really episode one hundred because I had like five episodes in there where I had my my book Tolkien's Requiem, an audio mm-hmm. version of it posted, mm-hmm. and I eventually took those down because you know I'm selling the book. Um, oh right. And uh, how many episodes? Was so that? I mean, I I did I had to go through the process of recording them, so I don't know. So wait, are those included in our current episode numbers or not? Well, not anymore. You can't download them anymore. But they were part of the they were part of the episode numbering. So if we had kept them in, we'd be over a hundred right now. No. No, so, I'm saying it's the current. Like I didn't I didn't change the numbering scheme when I took those out. Oh, so we're kind of cheating. Kind of. Well, maybe. Mm-hmm. But. Um, well, how many recordings? But you know, I was just thinking about it, and I was like, who cares? How many recordings were there, though? Uh, like five or six. I don't know. Anyway, let's just no let's bombed. let's get. No, I think we're still good. Either way, we're gonna be at, we're gonna be at hundred episodes soon. So. Okay. All right. I'll on. dig it. I'll dig it. Just making small talk. Yeah. Right. Okay. I just wish you hadn't brought it up, but whatever. Sorry. All right. Well, anyway, back to happier topics. Oh, let me uh, let me say first. So, as always, um, Patreon. Uh, think. Things have been a little quiet on the uh, Patreon yeah. pledge front lately, so uh, we want to first of all say, as always, thank you to those who are current patrons, and Most you guys, rock, you guys yep. are rock stars, um, and uh, we just want to encourage everybody who has not given yet and is able to maybe contribute uh, $2 or $5 a month to keep the Tolkien Road podcast going, mm-hmm. um, to do so, to go on over to TolkienRoad.com or Patreon.com slash Tolkien Road, and you can find out... Um, how your help will not only contribute to putting this podcast out every week, but will uh, also get you all kinds of cool stuff, all cool stuff, like all kinds of cool, cool stuff, stuff that you wouldn't yeah. get otherwise. Yeah. So head on over there, and if you want to be a part of next month's drawing, then you need to make your pledge by January thirty first. So yeah, yeah. By January, why wait? Why by January thirty first? Well, if you want to be a part of the next month's drawing. Oh, right. 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 I mean, there'll be a drawing after that. Do we know what one. the drawing is going to be yet? Uh, no, but it'll be cool. Last, oh, I know it's going to be cool. The first month, it was... Um, uh, the first month, it was... It was a choice between a few different things. Right. And uh, yeah. Margaret Lyon won, and she won a copy of... She chose a copy of 
uh, The Ladies of Beleriand, which is uh, volume three of the history of Middle Earth. Ah, yeah, awesome. which is awesome because it's got like the full epic poem of Baron and Luthien in there. So that the Lay of Lithian. That sounds like um, like Margaret made a pretty darn good choice there. I would say so. Mm-hmm. I would say so. Um, so let's rock and roll on the correspondence. All right, so, let's yeah, do so, it. So, Are you done so, with the Patreon? Pitch? Uh, well, that's it for this episode. But uh, come back at you <laughs> next time. Uh, but yeah, please do go over and at least check out. There's stuff posted over there. Um, you know, even free stuff you might just want to check out. So head on over and check it out. Check it out. Mm-hmm. Check it out. Name that show. I, I oh, know. you never watched Full House, did you? Never I thought that was. I thought that was cut it out. I changed it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Keep you on your toes. <laughs> It was more you had, just the, come, uh, you had just come back from Germany at that time, so you were still, like, learning how to speak English. That's probably true, yeah. actually. But it's still the, you know, main idea. It out had the same words in both. Anyway. Okay. Um, moving on. Moving on. Uh, a secret word update. hmm So, um, uh, Aaron, the reason, Thiessen, he correctly guessed our... our Secret word from two episodes ago. So, so he is the one that chose today's secret word. Mm-hmm. So be on the listen out for uh, for today's secret word chosen by Aaron. And Shannon is our winner from last week's episode. The secret word was? Uh, comedy, right? No, last week's. Oh. That's the one that Aaron guessed. That was two weeks ago. Uh, bananas? Bananas. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Bananas. And we actually, I want to give props, so Shannon was the first one to mm-hmm. guess it correctly. However, we had three additional correct guesses wow. um, from Mary Grace, Aaron, uh-huh. again, and uh, Matt. Matt, nice. Matt, yeah. Nice. Um, Matt Scarrant. Yeah, Matt yeah. Scarrant. And so props to all of you guys for correctly guessing it. The trick you know, it's a two-edged sword with the secret word, right? Not only do you have to listen attentively and pick up on it, but then you have to quickly, mm-hmm. you have to be the first one to get it. Yeah, you got to be quick, you gotta be quick the, on the draw. Into the Tolkien Road Podcast Gmail account. So, um, way to go, everybody that guessed it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and just be quicker on the draw yeah. next week, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, oh, what was I thought was funny was Matt Scarrant's actually, he asked in his email, he was like, by the way, was the secret word for last week bananas? And then he was like, uh, you know, come to think of it, that's probably not right. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth a try. <laughs> hey, that's what I, you know, whenever I, uh, whenever I teach, um, you know, like high schoolers and middle schoolers, I always tell them, like, um, when I'm giving a quiz, I'm like, put, put an answer, you know, like. Right. Just try. Just try. Don't leave it blank. Right. Because you, you know? never know. You might be right. You're definitely not going to get any points if you leave it blank, but you might get it right if you take it take a wild guess or at least get partial credit that's right yes or which... write something really funny and i just feel like giving you credit because it's so good exactly you know? yeah exactly yeah so you're never gonna never gonna lose by at least uh giving <clears> it a <throat> shot that's right um all right so shannon let us know what next week's secret word should be we will be anxiously awaiting mm-hmm. your choice um let's see Yes, Aaron's picking this week's secret word. And I already told you what it was, right? Yes, you did. Okay, good. All right. We have a little bit of correspondence now that is not secret word related. First, we have a note from Mary Grace. She said, thanks for reading my poem. Uh, uh, do you really have course. to thank us? I mean... <laughs> thanks for writing your poem and letting seriously, us read it on air. I know, right? I mean, we should be thanking you. Thank you for allowing us to inspire you. Yes, there you yeah. go. Well, well, really, said. it's probably more Tolkien inspiring her, but, you know, at least being a, allowing us to be a forum a for, right. for airing her poetic genius. Yes. Yes. There you go. Well, thank you, Mary Grace. We always look forward to <clears throat> your Absolutely. literary contributions. Absolutely. Um, she also said uh, a note about the previous chapter. I found it interesting. So she's talking about Flotsam and Jetsam, right? Mm-hmm. Um I found it interesting that the breaking of the fellowship and the events afterward transpired in nine days. For was not the company the nine walkers set against the evil doings of the nine riders? Mm. Mm. Nine seems to be a very symbolic number. Yes, nine. Which is interesting. Because, you know, there's there's all kinds of symbolic numbers in the Bible. Nine, I don't think, is one of them. 
but it seems like Tolkien has latched on to nine for a reason. Um, well, there's the whole nine thing of like um, praying a novena, right? That's true. That is true. Yeah. yeah. Nine, yeah. Is there anything else? Well, the novena? whole reason that came from is because it was ten days after uh, the ascension that um, Pentecost occurred, right? So they... So there was a tent. So Ascension was on the 40th day after the resurrection, and then Pentecost was on, on the, the 50th. 50th day. So there was. So they prayed for nine days, Got and then it. the tenth day, oh, the Holy Spirit came. Right. That's cool. That's where the whole novena thing comes from. Well, so that's very cool. it is. So on your question, being in the Bible, um, so nine there it is, is actually. Yeah. Mentioned. All right. That yeah, is kind of a symbolic number, and that's interesting. That you know, that isn't. It is interesting, Mary Grace. It just makes. I, I like that. I'm a total nerd about that kind of stuff. So. Um, uh, <clears throat> you've got you think of like nine writers mm-hmm. nine days the nine members of the fellowship I don't know that Tolkien ever talked about that number anywhere and I, I don't know that it was intentional in any way but it is interesting at least to think that like now maybe something good things are going to start happening perhaps mm. you know maybe this is the term the true turn of the tide right yeah that's a good point but that's there's still a, a lot point. of fighting to be done uh, heck yes there is absolutely all right, one more correspondence. We have lots of haiku. Good. I'm just trying to make sure I'm sifting through all of it. Um, so we have a note from um, Matt Scarens. He uh, addressed the email to the lady crowned with many jewels. And also to John, speaker of wisdom in the realm of podcast. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So he um, he sent us a rather extended snippet from Unfinished Tales, Mm -hmm. uh, which is entitled Concerning Gandalf, Saruman, and the Shire. Hmm. He says it's too good not to share in light of episode 95. Cool. I think I should read the whole thing. Uh, How long do you think it'll take? Do you want to summarize Um, it? or? I don't think it'll take me that long. I'm a fast reader. Um, I think it looks long because my phone is small. That may be it. Yeah. We'll go ahead and give it a shot. Let's give it a try. And... uh, um, We'll make sure I make a loud noise when I'm done in case you fall asleep while I'm reading. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's already a long podcast. It's not like we're going to, like, you know. That's true. If people, if people are still listening to us at the 96th episode, they've gotten the point by this time that we <laughs> kind of are long-winded and draw things out. Yeah, so. and enjoy rabbit trails. Yeah. However, this is not a rabbit trail. It no, actually, it's not. It's relevant. Um, it's totally relevant. Yeah. So, um, Matt, thank you for taking the time to type this out, first of all. And this is from Unfinished Tales, concerning Gandalf, Saruman, and the Shire. Now, because of his dislike and fear in the later days, Saruman avoided Gandalf, and they seldom met, except at the assemblies of the White Council. It was at the Great Council held in 2851 that the halfling's leaf was first spoken of, and the matter was noted with amusement at the time, though it was afterwards remembered in a different light. The council met in Rivendell, and Gandalf sat apart, silent, but smoking prodigiously, a thing he had never done before on such an occasion, while Saruman spoke against him and urged that, contrary to Gandalf's advice, Dolgador should not yet be molested. Both the silence and the smoke seemed greatly to annoy Saruman, and before the council dispersed, he said to Gandalf, "'When weighty matters are in debate, Mithrandir, I wonder a little that you should play with your toys of fire and smoke while others are in earnest speech.' But Gandalf laughed and replied, "'You would not wonder if you used this herb yourself. You might find that smoke blown out cleared your mind of shadows within. Anyway, it gives patience to listen to error without anger. But it is not one of my toys. It is an art of the little people away in the West.' Merry and worthy folk, though not of much account, perhaps in your high policies. Saruman was a little appeased by this answer, for he hated mockery, however gentle, and he said then coldly, You jest, Lord Mithrandir, as is your way. I know well enough that you have become a curious explorer of the small, weeds, wild things, and childish folk. Your time is your own to spend if you have nothing worthier to do, and your friends you may make as you please. But to me the days are too dark for wanderers' tales, and I have no time for the simples of of peasants. Gandalf did not laugh again. He did not answer, but looking keenly at Saruman, he drew on his pipe and sent out a great ring of smoke with many smaller rings that followed it. Then he put up his hand, as if to grasp them, and they vanished. 
With that, he got up and left Saruman without another word, but Saruman stood for some time silent, and his face was dark with doubt and displeasure. Now, truth to tell, observing Gandalf's love of the herb that he called pipeweed, for which he said, if for nothing else, the little people should be honored, Saruman had affected to scoff at it, but in private he made trial of it, and soon began to use it. And for this reason the Shire remained important to him. Yet he dreaded, lest this should be discovered, and his own mockery turned against him, so that he, sh he would be laughed at for imitating Gandalf, and scorned for doing so by stealth. This then was the reason for his great secrecy in all his dealings with the Shire, even from the first before any shadow of doubt had fallen upon it, and it was little guarded, free for those who wished to enter. For this reason also Saruman ceased to go thither in person, for it came to his knowledge that he had not been all unobserved by the keen-eyed halflings, and some, seeing the figure as it were of an old man clad in grey or russet, stealing through the woods or passing through the dusk, had mistaken him for Gandalf. After that, Saruman went no more to the Shire, fearing that such tales might spread and come maybe to the ears of Gandalf. But Gandalf knew of these visits and guessed their object, and he laughed, thinking this the most harmless of Saruman's secrets. But he said nothing to others, for it was never his wish that anyone should be put to shame. Matt says that's only part of it, but the whole section is definitely worth reading. Cool. So that's that's kind of funny. I haven't read that section before. Um, that's a uh, that's a cool story. It, um, it you know it made me think as I was listening to it, like you know we get this little picture of Saruman in this story, and mm -hmm. then it's kind of on the tail end of his fall. Um, you know, his fall from from grace and his fall from glory. Right. Um, and you know, we talked a little bit about several episodes back about the about the origin of the of the wizards of the Istari. Right. And um, uh, you know, it's kind of it's kind of sad in a way to think about Saruman. Like he's just, I, mm -hmm. I think he always just eyed Gandalf with suspicion and like thought Gandalf was going to supplant his greatness or something like that. You know, I'm trying to think. There, I feel like there's another. There's like another story that there. I think there's many stories that that relates to. It's almost like a, um, in a way, it has it. It, it bears a resemblance to like the uh, King Saul and David story, you know, from the Old Testament, oh, right? Yeah. Where King Saul, like, um, you know, David comes along and, um, and he's like this, you know, young man, and and you know, they're they're working together at first, and Saul you know, gets lauded. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like this mm -hmm. subtle, Saul just views David, even though he's, even though David is on his side, Saul, Saul just increasingly views him as like with suspicion. And like threat. he's out, he's yeah. out to take my, my role, right. you know? Right. And, um, it seems like there, that same sort of dynamic goes on with Saruman. With Saruman, yes. You know? Yeah. And, and I think maybe the lesson I take away from that and anything, cause I think that can happen in any number of ways in real life. Right. Um, but the lesson I kind of take away from that is just like Gandalf was just so focused on his purpose. Mm -hmm. He wasn't focused on being great. He wasn't mm -hmm. focused on um, uh, anything other than really what his mission in life was, yeah. right? What he had yeah. been sent over there to do. He wasn't focused on being the powerful and the wonderful and being lauded by all these people. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Saruman... It, that's what it became about for him. Right. You know? Yeah. So he was afraid. <laughs> Even something as silly as like, oh, you know what? Gandalf was right about this pipe weed. It's actually pretty good stuff. Like, yeah. how hard would it have been? Just to admit that, Just right? to admit and, that and be like, hey, yeah. Gandalf, you were right, buddy. Like, high five. Right, you know? yeah. But instead, Sauron's like, no, I'll look like a fool if I admit mm -hmm. it, you know? He's so concerned with the perception of others. Yeah. You know? And it's just like, when you care too much about what other people think, that can... That can lead to and it's a constant temptation. You know, oh, absolutely, yeah. it is. Yeah, but it's such a it's such a distraction. You realize mm -hmm. when you kind of take that step back mm -hmm. and from your own life, and you know the the old Ignatian method of like um, stepping outside oneself. Yes, you know, for, and seeing like, yourself from see, from outside yourself. Yeah, viewing yeah. yourself from outside yourself. Right. You know, it sounds kind of weird and new agey, but it's not really. That's not what it's all about. It's just about being able to objectify yourself in your own mind instead right. of constantly being subjective right you know yes about yourself exactly um exactly and seeing you how perhaps other people see you mm -hmm. and especially how god sees you you know right um yeah so anyway that's a great passage thanks it's, for sharing it's, that yeah it's really it is great it's um it, kind of, it does make you like pity saruman yeah and, there's uh, all kinds of just great snippets like that and 
the very in, especially in unfinished tales, but also in you know all throughout the history of Middle Earth. And uh, yeah, eventually I hope we can. Might be a while, but you know, we're yeah. we're gonna try and do some stuff when we we're all, we're almost done with book three um, of Lord of the Rings, and so we're gonna try and do a couple of interstitial episodes before we move on to book four. Cool. So maybe we'll do a maybe couple we'll do some of chapters tales. from there. Yeah. That would be cool. That would be cool. Now we also know why, because uh, didn't they find, obviously they had the pipe weed mm-hmm. that they had found at, you know, in Isengard. Right. So now we know now where we know. that came from. And knowing is half the battle. Knowing is half the battle. Yeah. I like to take it a step further and say that knowing is 75% of the battle. Wow, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but no more than 75. Mm, yeah, probably not. Okay. Yeah. If my calculations are correct. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Matt, for sending that in. That was really good stuff. Yeah, yeah thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, that's good stuff. I want to go. Mm-hmm. I need to go find that and read more about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's it for correspondence this week. Yeah. Other than haiku. Yeah. Other than haiku. Mm-hmm. All right. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's talk about chapter ten. Okay. So the voice of Saruman. Um, so when we left off last time, uh, chapter nine was really all about catching up with Merry and Pippin and finding out what had been going on at Isengard. Right. Um, and um, as you'll recall, a few of the party at the beginning of that chapter had gone, had left the south end of Isengard and had gone around to the north end where Treebeard was to meet mm-hmm. with Treebeard. Mm-hmm. And so at the beginning of this chapter, uh, the southern group, Mary Pippin, Gimli, Legolas, Aragorn, and a few others, um, decide, okay, let's, let's head on up to Orthanc. And, mm-hmm. Or maybe just try and go meet up with the rest of the group on the north side. Right. And they quickly see them, and they're all kind of congregating at the entrance to Orthanc. Right. Because Gandalf and Theoden have gone to meet with Treebeard. Right. So now they're kind of like yeah. meeting in the middle. Now Treebeard hangs back. So right. here's what it says. Right. It says, They passed through the ruined tunnel and stood upon a heap of stones, gazing at the dark rock of Orthanc, and its many windows, a menace still in the desolation that lay all about it. The waters had now nearly all subsided. Here and there, gloomy pools remained, covered with scum and wreckage. But most of the wide circle was bare again, a wilderness of slime and tumbled rock, pitted with blackened holes and dotted with posts and pillars leaning drunkenly this way and that. At the rim of the shattered bowl there lay vast mounds and slopes like the shingles cast up by a great storm, and beyond them the green and tangled valley ran up into the long ravine between the dark arms of the mountains. Across the waste they saw riders picking their way. They were coming from the north side, and already they were drawing near to Orthanc. There is Gandalf and Theoden and his men, said Legolas. Let us go and meet them. Walk warily, said Le- said Mary. These are loose. There are loose slabs that may tilt up and throw you down into a pit if you don't take care. So a little bit of a treacherous walk, but um, so we're all going up to meet together at the mm-hmm. footsteps of Orthanc. Mm-hmm. Um, Gandalf says, uh, gives them a warning as they approach, and says, um, uh, there is no knowing what he can do or may choose to try. A wild beast cornered is not safe to approach. And Saruman has mm-hmm. powers you do not guess. Beware of his voice. So, um, you know, they're kind of they're kind of wondering. They, they all have this feeling that Saruman, even though he's defeated, it's not necessarily safe yet. You know, right. Saruman... Well, Gandalf looks, has that feeling. I don't yeah. know if the others do. I kind of got the feeling that, like, Gimli and... The, the hobbits were like, I want to see him. I want to see him. Like they didn't. They weren't. Yeah, that's a good point. They weren't really. You know, I think. I think that's why Gandalf uttered that warning because I think they were just kind of like, you know, it's like a trip to the zoo for them, right? Like they wanted to just go see the the caged lion. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Gandalf was like, uh, you know, he's still very dangerous. So yeah, Pippin definitely is wondering, like, what's the danger? Will he yeah. shoot us and pour fire out of the windows? Right. I don't know. I, I get the sense that they're all kind of wondering, like, what can he do? Because they know he's a powerful wizard. Yeah, they do. Yeah. But I think they're kind of still a little bit riding high on their, um... Yeah. On their victory. Yeah. You know? And they kind of, like, have this bit of a, um... I don't know what's the right word. Like, they have a bit of a, a chip on their shoulder. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like, they're yeah. kind of like, eh, we've defeated him already. What else can he do? That's right. You know? Yeah. And they probably yeah. want to, they're probably hungry to just make him feel that he's the loser. Right, you know? exactly. I want to that. rub it in his face a little yeah, bit. Yeah, rub it in his face a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, so, um, so we get a little further down. Wormtongue is the first to respond as they call to the tower and, um, and they quickly turn, tell him to get Saruman. I want to read this description of Saruman's voice. Um, actually, why don't you read it? So it, it uh, a little bit in it, where it says the window closed, they waited, that paragraph. 
Um, hold on. I thought I was. Oh, I see. Yeah. The window closed. They waited. Hold on. I'm gonna turn on some. It's getting a little chilly in here. So oh, even going. you admit that. Well, All so, my so sorry for the background noise, but it's you Didn't know. Didn't clue you in. Okay. A little chilly in here. There we go. Are we good now? Yeah, you're good. Green light. All right. Yeah. The window closed. They waited. Suddenly, another voice spoke, low and melodious. It's very sound and enchantment. Those who listened unwarily to that voice could seldom report the words that they heard. And if they did, they wondered, for little power remained in them. Mostly they remembered only that it was a delight to hear the voice speaking. All that it said seemed wise and reasonable, and desire awoke in them by swift agreement to seem wise themselves. When others spoke, they seemed harsh and uncouth by contrast, and if they gainsaid the voice, anger was kindled in the hearts of those under the spell. For some, the spell lasted only while the voice spoke to them, and when it spoke to another, they smiled, as men do who see through a juggler's trick while others gape at it. For many, the sound of the voice alone was enough to hold them enthralled, but for those whom it conquered, the spell endured when they were far away, and ever they heard that soft voice whispering and urging them. But none were unmoved, none rejected its pleas and its commands without an effort of mind and will so long as its master had control of it. Yeah, it's really, really fascinating description. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I love, I feel like there's something very unique about the way Tolkien handles, like, magic in his story. Because mm-hmm. there's obviously, obviously Gandalf and Saruman have, like, magical powers. Um, but it's not like, it's not like Harry Potter magical powers, you know? Or, or they're more to some, subtle to some degree to some degree maybe they are I mean I think we a couple of times we maybe get a glimpse of of them having powers where it's like you know waving the magic wand or the magic staff and something awesome happening but yeah um, but at the same time like that's just not how they normally operate and there seems to be kind of a more subtle level that's their normal that that consists in their normal abilities and so Saruman mm-hmm. has the voice right he has the voice that's able to like almost like enchant Right, and it's kind of unexpected, right? Like, it's kind of something you don't even realize that you're falling prey to until it's too late. It's 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 almost like a hypnosis or something. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a mystery how he he works the the voice into being so powerful. You you kind of wonder if it's like, is it, were we just talking about an ability to, is it merely an ability to, like, um... First of all, control of the tone of the voice so that it's aesthetically pleasing and then knowing the right words to say in order to just being yeah. persuasive, yeah. powerful in persuasion, or um, or is there is there like an, another level, um, almost like a, a preternatural level of, um, you know, uh, just a, a power, like does, the vo- does his voice in and of itself have some kind of power over lesser beings that right. it otherwise you know that 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 goes beyond just mere persuasion and having a nice voice you know right well it's funny in this in this um in this particular description i i got the impression that the voice the power of the voice was more in its tone mm-hmm. was more in its delivery because mm-hmm. it even said that once it's done speaking nobody even remembers what was said yeah it, it's just more of a like a charm that yeah. that just kind of like you said like a hypnosis mm-hmm. kind of thing so I don't know that the words really even matter I feel like they might against a tougher opponent you know like say something like Gandalf who's actually yeah is prepared and ready to stand firm but against just you know little piddly people it's kind of like it doesn't even matter what he says it's just in how he delivers it's, i guess it's probably a both and i mean it's like it probably you know is. it's it's like Depends there's the there's there's a there's a skill there kind of like a natural skill mm-hmm. um of both word like argument and reason and right and, and but also like the the beauty of the words you use but it seems it definitely seems like it's spiritualized in a way that kind of raises Absolutely. it to the next level you know yeah. like because i'm i'm um when i teach writing uh, when I teach writing like a persuasive essay, you know, the parts of it are like, there's the art, there's the core of the argument, the substance of the argument. Um, and that's, that's an important part. But the flip side of it is if you just present your argument in a really dry way, like no one cares. Oh yeah. And, absolutely. but if you present it in such a way that it's beautiful, 
even if you could be wrong, but if it's beautiful, mm-hmm. you're going to win a lot of people to your side. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That's if you true. communicate it in a beautiful way. Yeah. You need a, some of that charism, mm-hmm. right? You know, that, that kind of drawing people yeah. in uh, with something that's more than just the written word. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it so makes me wish that I had this power over my children. <laughs> like, I kind of wish that I could just, hey, you know, hypnotize in the, them. In the words of... Uh, in the words of Machiavelli, who's is, Machiavelli? He's the fam- he's the guy that wrote that wrote the Prince, which is the famous um, like guide to being an effective ruler. Oh, okay. And he said something like, you know, uh, something along the lines of, "It is better to be feared than to be loved." Yes. Um, <laughs> when it comes to ruling effectively. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. You say I need to be more more fearful. Yeah. I need to inspire fear. No, I'm just, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just kind of joking about that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, not everybody has the power to, um, it's probably a rare, it's probably a much rarer thing that you have, you just have this really strong ability to inspire people with your words, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a rare, it's maybe a rare gift. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, but it's, uh, Saruman seems to be using it rather effectively. He does. And so I like how he starts out and he, he kind of like plays like he's an old man, like just an old man who they're bothering. But, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why must you disturb my rest? Oh. Will you give me no peace at all by night or day? Its its tone was that of a kindly heart aggrieved by injuries undeserved. <laughs> um, I like Gimli's little thing here, like and yet unlike, and that actually harkens mm-hmm. back to um, to Gimli saying, I want to, I wish to see him and learn if he really looks like you, Gandalf. Um, the description of Saruman is his face was long. Uh, hold on, let's go back a little bit. Um, and they saw a figure standing at the rail, looking up down upon them. An old man swathed in a great cloak, the color of which was not easy to tell, for it changed if they moved their eyes or if he stirred. His face was long, with a high forehead. He had deep, darkling eyes, hard to fathom, though the look that they now bore was grieved and benevolent, and a little weary. His hair and beard were white. But strands of black still showed about his lips and ears. Siri thinks I'm talking to her for some reason. That's weird, because I just dropped my phone on the floor. Yeah, that's weird. That's very weird. Um, his hair and... I bet it was when I said his hair. That sounds kind of like, hey, Siri. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait. Wait, was it your phone wasn't unlocked or anything, was it? You no. don't have to press a button. But it hears my voice, right? Oh, is that one of the upgrades for the new phone? I think so. It, like, recognizes your... You train it to recognize your voice. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it is kind of... It's a little bit dangerous. It's I a think, little creepy. I don't know. Anyway. His hair and beard were white, but strands of black still showed about his lips and ears. And so that's where um, Gimli says, like and yet unlike. So uh, there's some similarities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's got the black... He's kind of got some black strands going through. Um, I think they did a really solid job of casting Christopher yes, Lee as Saruman. I would agree. Based mm-hmm. on that description. Mm-hmm. Um, in the movies, even though I think Christopher Lee had hoped to play Gandalf. Sure. I think he played a much more he effective want Saruman. To play Gandalf. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, here's, here's Saruman's, a, bit, a little bit of Saruman's opening speech. But come now, two at least of you I know by name. Gandalf, I know you, I know too well to have much hope that he seeks help or counsel here. But you, Theoden, Lord of the Mark of Rohan, are declared by your noble devices, and still more by the fair countenance of the House of Eorl. O worthy son of Thingol, that th- the thrice renowned, why have you not come before, and as a friend? Much have I desired to see you, mightiest king of western lands, and especially in these latter years, to save you from the unwise and evil counsels that beset you. Is it yet too late? Despite the injuries that have been done to me, in which the men of Rohan, alas, have had some part. Still I would save you, and deliver you from the ruin that draws nigh inevitably, if you ride upon this road which you have taken. Indeed, I alone can aid you now. And I like how Theoden, you know, it's kind of a, um, we we got a little bit of a mystery here as to what's going on with Theoden, because, um, he doesn't respond at first. It's almost like he wants to respond, but he's not quite sure how. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he's definitely in a state of turmoil. Mm-hmm. Like, you kind of think he's going to fold. Yeah. You know? Because, I mean, that was a very... It was kind of a complimentary yeah. you know, greeting. And it's funny because the riders that are with him are almost like, 
oh, this Saruman's saying some interesting things. Yeah. Maybe we should listen to him. Yeah, you know, they're exactly. All like they're murmuring. all totally under his spell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I even I thought, I was like, no, they didn't know. Because I, th- I, I thought he was, I thought he'd be like, you know what? You're right. Mm-hmm. We should be friends. That's right. I like this part where it says, It seemed to the riders that Gandalf had never spoken so fair and fittingly mm-hmm. to their lord. Rough yes. and proud now seemed all his dealings with Theoden. Yeah, in con- contrast. Right, but... they're like, Gandalf never talked like this to our king. Yeah. Now this guy seems like he's pretty fond of our king. Yeah. Maybe we picked the wrong side here. Right, you know? yeah, yeah. Saruman's working his magic. And over their hearts crept a shadow, the fear of a great danger, the end of the mark and a darkness to which Gandalf was driving them. While Saruman mm-hmm. stood beside a door of escape, holding it half open so that a ray of light came through. There was yeah. a heavy silence. So, um, it's almost, so it does seem that like in Saruman's voice, even as he's saying these words, there's something else being communicated. There's like kind of a, a spirit being communicated. Yeah. You know, because yeah, they, they see the shadow over yeah. their heart and yeah. Yeah. There's definitely, it seems like he had a way of just kind of changing their perspective. Just right. like that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like they started to to second guess everything that's happened so far and they started to see it in a different light. Right. One that favors Saruman more than Gandalf. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um So and and Gimli is the first one that tried that kind of like tries to break everything up and be yeah. like, Okay, the words of this wizard stand on their heads. In the language of Orthonk, help means ruin and saving means slaying. That is plain. But we do not come here to beg. I like that Gimli is the first mm-hmm. one to respond because it fits with that whole thing that like the the dwarves are hard mm-hmm. to master. You know, yes. when we talked about the rings yes. and the rings given to the dwarves. Right. Sa- even Sauron was unable to really master them, right? Yep. yep. Um, with his normal ability, you know, normal kind of subtle arts, right? And what do you think that is? Do you think that's something that Ale like put into them, or is it just more of their, um, you know, is it just kind of an innate quality of theirs? I don't know. It's an interesting question. I don't really know what to make of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, they do. I mean, they are so you know, definitely that like the toughest, yeah, and the hardest, you know, of all the of all the creatures we've met so far. But it kind of you kind of wonder where does that come from? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. It's an interesting question. I don't know. It's uh, you know, maybe eventually we'll do just a full on episode on dwarves, on dwarves, as much as we can learn about them. But yeah, but it is Gimli, and um, and that seems to fit with what we yeah. know about dwarves. That he's the first one to to call BS on, uh, on right. Star exactly. Mark. That's totally what he does. He's like, yeah. you know, uh, Saruman, you're just idiot. Yeah. Well, I love that. I like the way he said it, though. He's like, the words of this wizard stand on their heads. It's like, I just love that imagery, mm-hmm. right? Because it's not, it's a very clever way of saying this is not what they, you know, these words are not what they seem, right? right. You need to actually translate them. Mm-hmm. And they actually mean the opposite of what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's immediately Saruman knows how to handle them. It's almost yeah, like, he does. it's almost like, you know, this is like Saruman's, like, um, you know, a big political speech for him. And, like, Gimli's the one, like, you know... He's like the naysayer he's like, in the crowd. He's like the, uh, you know, he's like the redneck in the crowd that doesn't have all the words, but he just stands up and he's like, you're a liar, you know? Yeah, like, and yeah, that, yeah. That, that's kind of the best he can do. <laughs> and, then, and then the politician turns back around and is like, oh, 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 it's okay. We'll, we'll get to your concerns eventually, sir. Yeah, you know, and, like, right. you know, it's that crowd, kind yeah. of crowd control. Yeah. Peace, yeah. said Saruman. I do not speak to you yet, Gimli Gloin's son. Far away is your home, and small concern of yours are the troubles of this land. But it was not by design of your own that you became embroiled in them, and so I will not blame such part as you have played. A valiant one, I doubt not. But I pray you, allow me first to speak with the king of Rohan, my neighbor, and once my friend. Mm. Um, so he puts it to Theoden, what do you have to say? Mm-hmm. Um, puts and, Theoden on the spot. Yeah, Theoden's still kind of unsure. Yeah, Theoden's like, this is a complete mystery to me right now. Yeah. I have no idea what's going on. Do you want to read Aomer's words there? So Uh, Aomer is the one that speaks up before Theoden. Oh, right, yeah. So Aomer says, Lord, hear me. Now we feel the peril that we we were warned of. Have we ridden forth to victory only to stand at last amazed by an old liar with honey on his forked tongue? So would the trapped wolf speak to the hounds if he could. What aid can he give you, forsooth? All he desires is to escape from his plight. But will you parley with this dealer in treachery and murder? Remember Theodred at the fords and the grave of Hama in Helm's Deep. Yeah, um, so Eomer isn't buying it for a no, second. No, he's not. Yeah, Eomer has to, uh, remembers too much of the of what Saruman and his forces did. Right, exactly. Um, so, um, 
it's good that Aomer's there, and so yeah. but Saruman has a response for him. Of course he does. If we speak of poison tongues, what shall we say of yours, young serpent? But come, Aomer, Aomin's son, to every man his part. Valor in arms is yours, and you win high honor thereby. Slay whom your lord names his enemies, and be content. Meddle not in policies which you do not understand. So it's basically, Oh, Aomer, I understand that you are a man of action, and that makes you so admirable. But do not meddle in things that are that are above your calling. You know, right. <laughs> that's basically Don't, what he says yeah, to him. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Um, these are matters too profound for your consideration. This is above your pay grade. That's right. So you just need to step aside. Yeah, and be let, a good let soldier. The big boys be a good soldier, and now it's time for me to have a conversation with your king. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so I mean, you can just see like Saruman. I think that so there definitely is a spiritual quality to this, but but Saruman is just a really, he's he's he's. A, He's also just as smooth talking as a polit, you know, as a, is. as a politician. Yeah, he you know? really is. And what I think is kind of, kind of interesting is you see, especially as you know more people start to stand up to him, he it mentions how, you know, you get these glimpse. You know, he starts out of just you know sweet talking, soft kind voice, but then as he starts to get more enraged, like these flashes of anger kind mm-hmm. of make their way make their ways in, and then you know he'll go back real quick to his soft voice. Which I think is interesting because it mentions his, you know, his um, his cloak. How you can't really tell what color it is because mm-hmm. it shifts with the light and right. as you move or whatever. Right. And I feel like his voice is kind of doing the same mm-hmm. thing. Like he's all sweet and you know, honey and kindness and flattery, and then all of a sudden you see these flashes right. of anger, and his voice gets really nasty for a second. And he's like, oh, but. But he knows exactly. Well, I think he's in perfect control. He knows exactly what he's doing. He does know exactly he, what he's doing. He kind of, he kind doing. of, he kind yeah. of lashes out for a moment. Yeah. But never loses, never lose, never lets it appear like, you know, it's um, it's like a complete, just like attack on somebody. Right. You know? Right. That's true. That's true. But I feel like he always draws it back to trying to be reason- always, unreasonable. Yes, he does know? always get himself back under control. But I think those flashes and those instances of starting to lose control mm-hmm. become more extended as the conversation progresses. Yeah. Oh, they definitely do. Yeah. Definitely do. You're right on. Because they're starting to wear him down. Mm-hmm. They're starting to figure out the mystery of yeah. Saruman's voice. So finally, Theoden gives his two cents. He says, We will have peace, said Theoden at last quickly and with an effort. Several of the riders cried out gladly. Because they thought he was like agreeing with Saruman. Right. Right. Theoden held up his hand. Yes, we will have peace, he said now in a clear voice. We will have peace when you and all your works have perished, and the works of your dark ma- master to whom you would deliver us. You are a liar, Saruman, and a corrupter of men's hearts. You hold out your hand to me, and I perceive only a finger of the claw of Mordor, cruel and cold. Even if your war on me was just, as it was not, for were you ten times as wise you would have no right to rule me and mine for your own profit as you desired. Even so, what will you say of your torches in Westfold and the children that lie dead there? And they hewed Hama's body before the gates of the Hornburg after he was dead. When you hang from a gibbet at your window for the sport of your own crows, I will have peace with you and Orthanc. So much for the house of Aorel. A lesser son of great sires am I, but I do not heed to lick your fingers. Turn elsewhither. But I fear your voice has lost its charm. Go Theoden. Yeah. Go Theoden. So Theoden uh, shows how far he's come since yeah. we first met him several chapters ago. Yes. And um, yeah. keeps getting stronger. You know, even though it seems like Sauron almost, almost kind of was successful in swaying him. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's almost like Theoden was kind of like fighting within himself, fighting against. Yeah, he was trying to Theoden's, get the courage or uh, Sauron's words to... within himself. Yeah. Yeah. To stand up to him. I think I think he was con- kind of con- put to confusion a little bit at first, and that's why he had trouble responding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then he finally finds his words. Yep. You know, it's almost like this internal battle. battle. Right, right. Uh, the riders gazed up at Theoden like men startled out of a dream. Harsh as an old raven's, their master's voice sounded in their ears after the music of Saruman. But Saruman, for a while, was beside himself with wrath. He leaned over the rail as if he would smite the king with his staff. To some, suddenly, it seemed that they saw a snake coiling itself to strike. Ugh, creepy. Yeah. Gibbets and crows, he hissed, and they shuddered at the hideous change. I'm just, I, I got to find out what a gibbet is. Do you know what a gibbet is? Um, no. I was thinking it was a giblet, but it's not. It's a gibbet. Uh, a gallows? Hmm. 
You give it. Because what did he say? He said. You hang from a gibbet. Jibbet. So you hang from oh, a. Oh, gibbet. Oh, gibbet. J -j -j gibbet? Yeah. With a j, j j sound? Okay. So it must be some kind of torture device. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, um, it actually comes from. It's related to the word, to an old French word of like club or staff. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Gibbet. 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 Does it have a picture? No, I think we're, I think that's, you know, I don't want to get too far into it. We got a okay. lot more of this chapter we to cover. We do have but, a lot more, I know. Um, but that's what it, apparently it is, is a gallows. And then maybe going back further, Tolkien may have had in mind more of a club. But he wants, but Theoden says he wants Sauron hanging from a gibbet. Yes, okay. So it must be some kind of... Oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Good call. I know. Um, you're smart. I just earned my paycheck, yo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, Dotard, what is the house of Eorl but a thatched barn where brigands drink in the reek, and their brats roll on the floor among the dogs? Too long have they escaped the gibbet themselves. But the noose comes, slow in the drawing, tight and hard in the end. Hang, if you will. Now his voice changed as he slowly mastered himself. I know not why I have had the patience to speak to you. For I need you not, nor your little band of gallopers, as swift to fly as to advance. Theoden, horse master. Long ago I offered you a state beyond your merit and your wit. I have offered it again, so that those whom you mislead may clearly see the choice of roads. You give me brag and abuse. So be it. Go back to your huts. So he's done with Theoden at this right. point. I think he's realized he's lost the battle against him. So his last chance is with Gandalf. Gandalf. Yeah. Good luck. Who he already kind of insulted, so... Gandalf. Right, exactly. <laughs> but you, Gandalf, for you at least I am grieved, feeling for your shame. How comes it that you can endure such company? For you are proud, Gandalf, and not without reason, having a noble mind and eyes that look both deep and far. Even now, will you not listen to my counsel? Gandalf stirred and looked up. What have you to say that you did not say at our last meeting? Or perhaps you have things to unsay. Unsay? Unsay? I endeavored to advise you for your own good, but you scarcely listened. You are proud and do not love advice, having indeed a store of your own wisdom. But on that occasion you erred, I think, misconstruing my intentions willfully. I fear that in my eagerness to persuade you I lost patience, and indeed I regret it. For I bore you no ill will, and even now I bear none, though you return to me in the company of the violent and the ignorant. How should I? Are we not both members of a high and ancient order, most excellent in Middle-earth? Our friendship would profit us both alike. Much we could still accomplish together to heal the disorders of the world. Let us understand one another and dismiss from, from thought these lesser folk. Let them wait on our decisions. For the common good I am willing to redress the past and to receive you. Will you not consult with me? Will you not come up? Um, so Saruman's last, you know, last appeal to Gandalf is basically like, remember the old times, buddy, mm -hmm. when you and I used to be, you know, in cahoots and we, you know, just talked about everything concerning all of the matters of the powers of Middle Earth, mm -hmm. right? You know, we could still be the ones in charge. Yeah. Right. The two of us together would be so much more made. powerful. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Um. And. Uh, and it says that Saruman was, you know, so great was his power, was the power that Saruman exerted in this last, last effort that none that stood within hearing were unmoved. But now the spell was wholly different. They heard the gentle remonstrance of a kindly king with an erring but much loved minister. But they were shut out, listening at a door to words not meant for them. Ill-mannered children or stupid servants overhearing the elusive discourse of their elders and wondering how it would affect their lot. Of loftier mold, these two were made, reverend and wise. It was inevitable that they should make alliance. Gandalf would ascend into the tower to discuss deep things beyond their comprehension in the high chambers of Orthanc. The door would be closed, and they would be left outside, dismissed to await allotted work or punishment. Even in the mind of Theoden, the thought took shape like a shadow of doubt. He will betray us. He will go. We shall be lost. So even here, it's funny, uh, Saruman's words work not only on Gandalf, or attempt to work not only on Gandalf or maybe they primarily not even on Gandalf but on the rest of the people around mm -hmm. there almost saying like this is none of your business anymore this yeah. is between me and Gandalf yeah right yeah and 
shutting them out of that conversation. Right. Yeah. Um, but Gandalf doesn't even um, consider it for a moment. He just says, Saruman, 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 you missed your path in life. You should have been the king's jester and earned your bread and stripes too by mimicking his counselors. Understand one another? I fear I'm beyond your comprehension. But you, Saruman, I understand now too well. I keep a clearer memory of your arguments and deeds than you suppose. When last I visited you, you were the jailer of Mordor, and there I was to be sent. Nay, the guest who has escaped from the roof will think twice before he comes back in by the door. Nay, I do not think I will come up. But listen, Saruman, for the last time. Will you not come down? Isengard has proved less strong than your hope and fancy make it. So may other things in which you still have trust. Would it not be well to leave it for a while? To turn to new things, perhaps? Think well, Saruman. Will you not come down? So what it... I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. This was a bit of a mystery to me. Because I'm trying to figure out what is Gandalf's purpose here. Like, why does he want Saruman to come down? Is he trying to win them over to their side? Or does he want to just bring them down and then stab them with his staff? Like, what is... What is he... Oh, no, I don't... I definitely don't think it's the second part. I think... I think he, um... I think he has in mind to... Uh... Convert to, him? To re... Not necessarily to convert him, but to... But to try and get Saruman to surrender so that he can re, be rehabilitated eventually over time. You know? It you know just seems strange to me that, that Gandalf would even think that was possible at this point. You know? Because it's like, he's already... Well, what are the options? He can either... He can either just try to assault him and, you know, and kind of kill him at yeah. that point, right? Um, or maybe it's, maybe they're just trying to say, like, look, the gig is up. You have to come out or you're going to be imprisoned here, right? Um, you, but there's, there's still, remember, I mean, Saruman is an immortal being, right? Just like Gandalf. Yeah, yeah, that's um, true. He's a, he's a Maiar, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's a powerful being. So... You know, I don't think Gandalf wants to treat him as being, like, beyond hope. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you, you know, you think back even to the Silmarillion, right? With both uh, Morgoth and Sauron, right? They were both defeated a few times, mm -hmm. but given a chance to kind of mend their ways over a long period of time, mm -hmm. right? To, yeah. to prove themselves different than what they used to be. Yeah. Um, so... Um, I think there's always a desire on the part of the good to find mercy for those, even for their vanquished enemies, right? Like to yeah. make that, to find that balance of mercy and justice, right? To make them pay, pay for their crimes, sure, but not to completely, not to the bitter end, right? Like not to the, not to the point of like utter death. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and the hope, and the hope that pay, and in paying for their crimes, they'll eventually have a change of heart, Right. Yeah, that that makes sense. But I just feel like, even if they even if they were to get Saruman to come down and get him rehabilitated, I feel like they would end off, and the company would be constantly living in fear of being, um, of being deceived. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I guess I just kind of hold that, which might not be the right attitude, but I kind of have like you know, once a bad guy, always a bad guy. There's always that potential. Right? You can take Saruman out of Isengard, but you can't take Isengard out of Saruman. And so it's just, it's just it's strange to me that he would, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I think it's a very merciful um, action on Gandalf's part to, mm -hmm. to have that hope, for sure. But to me, it just, um, I don't know, I'm kind of like, just kill him and be done with it. <laughs> like, just get it over with. <laughs> But you're right, um, he can't be killed, so... I guess well, that he can. Either. He can be killed, um, just like an elf can be killed, even though it's immortal, right? It can be killed, all right? Right. Um, but then can't it come back? I mean, is that what happened to Gandalf? Well, I don't know. I don't know what the destiny of... of uh, well, Gandalf was a special case. But yeah. I don't know what the destiny of a, of a Meyer would normally be once it yeah. once it's killed. I mean, I think it's spirit... I think it would be like what happens with the elves, where they go to the halls of Mondos, right? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That um, makes sense. But, uh, so they'd lose their bodies and mm -hmm. their spirits would be kind of imprisoned, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so no, I know I, I get what you're saying, but it's almost like that's the, um, that is the burden you carry in trying to maintain your own 
goodness while yeah. administering justice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you you know, to to go over you know, once once your enemy has stopped fighting, you can't just kind of cruelly put him to the death, right? For being yeah. your enemy, right? Yeah. Um that's what But that's has what, Saruman stopped fighting? No. The only reason he stopped fighting is because he's put in prison. You let him go, like you give him you get him out of that tower. It's just a matter of time before he turns around and stabs you in the back. Or runs off to Sauron and Yeah, but his it's it's almost like it's almost like the good don't have don't have that option. You know what I'm saying? Like don't like it that's a risk you always take. Yeah. That's a, there's yeah. always that risk, right? It's true. Um and and that's kind of like why why good so often in this world um kind of has to walk with a limp, right? Is because true. you're always you're all you're always trying to give people a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance, right? Um, and, um, you know, when it would be much easier just to be like, oh, he's evil, kill him. But then you become evil in the process. You know, you yourself become evil in the process by That's not true. showing mercy, right? That's true. I know. It's kind of a double-edged uh, sword, isn't it? It's, it's, like, it's like that would be... That would be the quick and efficient way of handling it, certainly. Yeah. But... But there would be repercussions on the road. Yeah. Yeah. But then what happens to Gandalf's reputation, right? Yeah. At that point, right? Yeah, that's true. That's um, true. Yeah. He, you know, he, he vanquishes enemies and cruelly put him to the death, you know? Yeah. That doesn't sound very Gandalf-like, you know? No, it doesn't. Absolutely not. And, and you know, from the very beginning, like... It's almost like they were instructed, right? The Istari were instructed when they came to Middle Earth, like you're you're going to be walking with a limp in the first place. It would be much more efficient for you to go and like proclaim yourself a powerful, a powerful king, and mm -hmm. which is what Saruman eventually tried to do, right? Uh, in order to battle Sauron, it would be much more efficient to proclaim yourself a powerful king and lord it over all of the lesser peoples of Middle Earth and marshal them to your service, but, um, in, in kind of a forced way. Yeah. But you're not permitted to do that. You have to use reason, and mm -hmm. you have to you have to use persuasion. Okay. And but you're never able to set yourself. You're never allowed to set yourself up as a king, right? Yeah. To master them. So that's kind of that's a great question. I mean, it really is. Um, and it's it gets it gets back to the whole notion of the ring and the power of the ring, right? Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, for sure. Because you can totally see Saruman putting his enemies to the death when they wouldn't surrender to him, right? Um, uh, but uh, but at the end, it's just not... Like, the only the only thing they could, that would be permitted to kill Saruman at this point is if it was a matter of life and death, right? Like, he came, he came at them trying to kill them, right? right? But now that he's held up his hands and been like, hold on, let's talk. You know, you've got to talk. Yeah. You, well, can, kill, you can keep him in prison... Yeah. But you can't, you know, but you can't just kill him, you know? No. Plus, he's also in this tower, which is apparently, like, really pretty tough tower, and they can't get into it. Yeah. That's the other part definitely, of it. Yeah, that's true. It is well, it's well fortified. And, and think about that. If he had tricked, if, if Gandalf had tricked Saruman into coming out just so he could kill him right there. Yeah. That would have been pretty horrible. Like, that would have been pretty that horrible. That would have been. You're right. You're absolutely right. But I just worry about... Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just um... it, it's it's a great question, but it's I mean, it really is like the that's kind of the limp <laughs> that the good and the just yeah. have to have to walk with in this world. Is like you can't um, you can't retaliate in exactly the way that you that your enemy probably would. You know, like you can't you you have to be bound by the rules yeah. even when others refuse to be. You got to take the high road. Yeah, which is not always easy. Um. Yeah. But okay. It's, um... Were you looking at something on your on your phone? No. Want to share? Oh, okay. Mm -mm. I'm I'm just still perplexed by the whole thing. Okay. Well, let's continue on. Okay. Um. So. Um. Saruman refuses to come down, and. Uh, and so you know they kind of settle that. Um. It looks like Saruman's going to remain in Orthanc indefinitely. Yeah. Um, he still tries to get Gandalf. Still tries to offer to him that he can leave Orthanc. Yeah, he uh, offers free him protection, choose, right? right? He says you can leave Orthanc free. Yeah. Right. 
He says, I have the power to protect you. I don't know. It just really kind of bugged me. Like, it, I, but that's just maybe I should just be quiet because that's well, I'm just, a little too much think of it. Just think of it the other way. <laughs> like, would you prefer that he just draw Saruman out and then, like, off with his no, head right there? No, you're right. But I guess I would rather he say not offer him protection, freedom. Like, I'd almost see rather be like, well, I feel like he should be a prisoner of war. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, that's kind of what he will be, right? Like, I guess, maybe. Um, yeah. Reasons for leaving you can see from your windows, answered Gandalf. Others will occur Others will occur to your thought. Your servants are destroyed and scattered. Your neighbors, you have made your enemies, and you have cheated your new master or tried to do so. If you kind of think about it with, what, with everything that Saruman has done. Yeah. He's he's going to be living in a very bad situation no matter where he is anyway, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Unless he just goes far away into exile, right? Um, yeah. And... Um, Gandalf would rather have him close, when right? I When I say free, I mean free. Free from bond, of chain, or command, to go where you will, even even to Mordor, Saruman, if you desire. But you will first surrender to me the key of Orthanc and your staff. They shall be pledges of your conduct to be ter- returned later if you merit them. So basically... Saruman's prison is going to be losing the key to Orthanc and um, and losing his staff, which the staff is right. pretty, That's pretty a big, big deal. deal. Right. That is a big deal. Yeah. Um, and he's gonna he's no longer gonna be the head of the order, right? The head of the the head of the um of the council. That's right? true. Or the White council. I mean, Gandalf would obviously come out on top. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I you know, it, and then the other thing is how much when your when your enemy has been defeated, like how much do you rub their noses in it, like yeah. you know. It's just, I know, I know the sense of like, look at all the evil he's done. He deserves to pay for his crimes, mm-hmm. but it's like, it's almost like the more powerful a person is, like the more dangerous that becomes. You know, that's true what, for for the one who has been victorious. Because if they, if they don't know to show a degree of mercy, mm-hmm. um, and and kind of deal deal wisely with the justice they meet out, mm-hmm. then they can look, they can end up looking like the aggressor and the bad one really quickly that's true and, it can and really not only looking like him. it but becoming it you know i mean that's really what um i mean i'm not a historian by any stretch of the imagination but that's basically what a lot of people say was the cause of world war Two, or what kind of enabled world war Two to happen right yeah. is because they were at the end of world war one we left germany in such a bad spot mm-hmm. right that they, they no saw i mean that's wars. that's the general kind of historical yeah. analysis on that right is that yeah. uh germany yeah germany got their face rubbed in it after yeah. world war one big mm-hmm. time and that fed the fuel for um uh for, for hitler for, to take control yeah for for the nazis yeah. to kind of rise and they you know talking about like getting payback you know for on mm-hmm. all the other countries for doing that right you know yeah um and that was one of the ways they that was one of the things they would kind of use um yeah it was, it was just finding that balance too though because you yeah. don't want to be like you know well, that's why they call him a wizard, right? That's why Gandalf's a wizard because <laughs> he's because so. he's got to be wise, right? He's got to be wise. He can see, yeah. He can solve all these mysteries that continue to perplex me in this whole exchange. Uh, Saruman laughs at that and he says, "Later, later, later. Yes, when you also have the keys of Barador itself, I suppose, and the crowns of seven kings and the rods of the five wizards, and have purchased yourself a pair of boots many sizes larger than those that you wear now. A modest plan." Hardly one in which my help is needed. I have other things to do. Do not be a fool. If you wish to treat with me, while you have a chance, go away and come back when you are sober. And leave behind these cutthroats and small ragtag that dangle at your tail. Good day. Um, so last, the last thing Saruman does is he tries to accuse Gandalf of basically exactly what he was doing, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Kind of weasel his way. Yeah, you're trying to look yeah. all just and everything, but you just want to go and claim all the power for yourself. Right. Yeah. You know, that's really what you're all about. Yeah. So for Gandalf, there's constantly this exercise of like, I don't want the power. I got mm-hmm. it's like this constant spiritual exercise mm-hmm. of like there's the power tries to come to him in different ways. Yeah. It's the same thing with Galadriel. Like the power tries to just hand itself to him in different ways. And it's this constant battle to resist it, right? Yeah. Internal battle to resist it. Yeah. Um, but I love this here. Saruman tries to walk away, like huff off, and um, and Gandalf says, "Come back, Saruman!" In a commanding voice, to the amazement of the others, Saruman turned again, and as if dragged against his will, he came slowly back to the iron rail, leaning on it, breathing hard. His face was lined and shrunken. His hand clutched his heavy black staff like a claw. "I did not give you leave to go," said Gandalf sternly. "I have not finished." 
You have become a fool, Saruman, and yet pitiable. You might still have turned away from folly and evil and have been of service. But you choose to stay and gnaw the ends of your old plots. Stay then. But I warn you, you will not easily come out again. Not unless the dark hands of the east stretch out to take you. Saruman, he cried, and his voice grew in power and authority. Behold, I am not Gandalf the Grey, whom you betrayed. I am Gandalf the White, who has returned from death. You have no color now, and I cast you from the order and from the council. He raised his hand and spoke slowly in a clear, cold voice. Saruman, your staff is broken. There was a crack, and the staff split asunder in Saruman's hand, and the head of it fell down at Gandalf's feet. Go, said Gandalf. With a cry, Saruman fell back and crawled away. At that moment, a heavy, shining thing came hurtling down from above. It glanced off the iron rail, even as Saruman left it and passing close to Gandalf's head, it smote the stair on which he stood. The rail rang and snapped. The stair cracked and splintered in glittering sparks. But the ball was unharmed. It rolled on down the steps, a globe of crystal, dark but glowing with a heart of fire. As it bounded away towards a pool, Pippin ran after it and picked it up. Of course it was Pippin. Right. <laughs> well, so I, I love that scene of you know Gandalf just finally is like okay you've chosen your path here you go here's your, mm-hmm. he, did, he he basically renders the judgment on he does on and he Gandalf, obviously shows himself on to be the greater right here, right I mean he's able to get Saruman to come back mm-hmm. right and uh, it's it's almost at the end here it's almost like a parent right like casting discipline upon his child right that's kind of the relationship here yeah and, and you know I think that that's that may be part of it as well as like you know when you're you've got a you give the opportunities for repentance and part of that you, you truly do want the the repentance and the choice and the, the more positive choice mm-hmm. maybe you want it in this case maybe not so much but you still give it because you're trying to let them show that they they've changed um and show yourself willing to be merciful right um but you know because again it's like if you just walked up to him and been like saruman your staff is broken you know that would have been like well that's you know, it's fair, but it still is pretty harsh. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And But he gives him a chance to kind of change. He does, and, yeah. And shows that he's not willing to And it shows that he's not willing right. to change. Saruman himself shows that he's not willing to change. He gave him several chances. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so Gandalf at that point looks quite just. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, to your point, it almost looked like he was being foolish to give him other options at first. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but finally, Gandalf says, Gandalf renders his judgment and says... You're done. Is it, um, it's a bit of a mystery to me, too, that, that Saruman, like, why did he not use his staff or any kind of, you know, like, why, you know what I'm saying? Like, why didn't he lash out with more? Like, he had the ability, right, to be more harmful, to use other means besides his words, Mm -hmm. his voice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I just wonder why he didn't use his his staff and try to to come at them with more well first more of all bigger. I mean he was surrounded even though Saruman's powerful like you know there's a wizard there of his yeah, own he's stature in Hothank, right he's in this fortified tower um, with a staff true but you know it's like eventually they'd probably figure out how to how to get to him right I don't know I don't know how the I don't yeah. know the mechanics of the staff you yeah. know <laughs> you know it's, um, just, it's funny because I didn't even really think about the staff I didn't think about Saruman having a staff until Gandalf broke it. And then I'm like, oh, well, yeah. Why didn't he use it before? Well, you know, and, and here's the thing. Like, even though the staffs, you know, the, the wizards seem to have powerful abilities using their staffs. Yeah. Um, like magic. It's still, even Morgoth, who is the greatest of all of the created beings, um, as he he expended, he ha- only had a limited amount of power, even though it was a vast amount of power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, of like the spiritual kind of magical power right um he still expended it and by the time the first age was coming to a close you'll remember like it was talking about how he was growing weaker and weaker Mm -hmm. you know because he was putting all of his his abilities into these creatures he was creating and and so he didn't have a limitless supply he just you know and so i have to think that the same thing would apply to saruman right he's Mm -hmm. put all of this energy into mustering this huge army that's now been defeated into creating you know all of these contraptions and everything and Isengard and you know his power has probably dwindled some right yeah, yeah that's probably and the true the defense of Isengard and, and all the other things so yeah 
he may not be as powerful as he once was. That's a good point. Uh, at least with the staff, right? Yeah. In, in kind of a marsh, in a martial way. Right. Right. Um, so the ball tossed out the window. Um, we don't learn much about it yet, except that Pippin goes and picks it up, and then Gandalf wants to get it. Here, my lad, I'll take it. I did not ask you to handle it, he cried, turning sharply and seeing Pippin coming up the steps, slowly, as if he were bearing a great weight. He went down to meet him and hastily took the dark globe from the hobbit, wrapping it in the folds of his cloak. I will take care of this, he said. It is not a thing, I guess, that Saruman would have chosen to cast away. Um, so, uh, it sounds like Wormtongue probably tossed that out the window. Yeah. And... And he pays for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, where... Let's see. I know he talks about, uh... The aim was poor, maybe, because he could not make up his mind whom he hated more, you or Saruman. Um... Anyway, yeah, I remember there was there's something in there about uh, sounding like Saruman was kind of whooping well, it up says on. Well, I guess that Wormtongue. even if we had entered in, we could have found few treasures in Orthanc more precious than the thing which Wormtongue threw down at us. Mm -hmm. A shrill shriek suddenly cut off came from an open window high above. It seems that Saruman thinks so too, said Gandalf. Let us leave them. Mm -hmm. So here's so jumping down a little further, this might speak a little bit more to what we were talking about with Gandalf's decision making. Uh, Mary asks, uh, were, were things likely to end any other way? And Gandalf says, not likely, mm -hmm. though they came to the balance of a hair, but I had reasons for trying, some merciful and some less so. First Saruman was shown that the power of his voice was waning. He cannot be both tyrant and counselor. When the plot is ripe, it remains no longer secret. Yet he fell into the trap and tried to deal with his victims piecemeal while others listened. Then I gave him a last chance and a fair one to renounce both Mordor and his private schemes and make amends by helping us in our need. He knows our need, none better. Great power he could have rendered, but he has chosen to withhold it and keep the power of Orthanc. He will not serve, only command. He lives now in terror of the shadow of Mordor, and yet he still dreams of riding the storm. Unhappy fool. He will be devoured if the power of the East stretches out its arms to Isengard. We cannot destroy Orthanc from without, but Sauron, who knows what he can do? Mm-hmm. Um, and what if Sauron does not conquer? What will you do to him? asked Pippin. I? Nothing. I will do nothing to him. I do not wish for mastery. What will become of him? I cannot say. I grieve that so much that was good now festers in the tower. Still for us, things have not gone badly. Strange, strange are the turns of fortune. Often does hatred hurt itself. I guess that, even if we had entered in, we would have found few treasures in Orthanc more precious than the thing which Wormtongue threw down at us. And then a shrill shriek suddenly cut off came from an open window high above. It seems that Saruman thinks so too, said Gandalf. Let us yeah. leave them. I already read that part. Yeah. Well, not the part before. I just continued on to That's it. true. You just continue on. All right. Fine. Okay. Um, yeah, but you're right. That that does shed a little bit of light so, onto, uh, yeah. you know, onto that mysterious exchange between them and, um, you know, how Gandalf chose to, to handle Saruman. Right. Um, so, you know, that's where... That's where we kind of leave off with Saruman. Um, he's in prison in Northank, and mm -hmm. we find out a little more about how he's going to remain imprisoned uh, per right. Gandalf's scheme. Right, right. Um, we, uh, we meet up again with Treebeard. Good old Treebeard. Um, Treebeard and a dozen other Ents came striding up. Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas gazed at them in wonder. Um, and Legolas and Treebeard have kind of a friendly conversation about uh, woods. Mm -hmm. uh, Treebeard compliments Mirkwood. Yep. Um, saying a very great force it and used Legolas to be. Compliments, compliments Fagor. Yep. And, um, and he says, you know, I hope I can come spend more time in Fangorn sometime. And, yeah. uh, Treebeard says, well, I hope you get your wish. And, mm -hmm. you know, and Legolas says, well, I might bring a friend too. Yeah. And they, when Treebeard <laughs> yeah. finds out who the friend is, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, Treebeard says, any elf that comes with you will be welcome. The friend I speak of is not an elf, said Legolas. I mean Gimli, Gloin's son here. Gimli bowed low, and the axe slipped from his belt and clattered on the ground. <laughs> I love that song. Oh, it's so great. It's like, at your service, uh, me lord. Ding! And she was Awkward. like... Awkward. Yeah, right? Awkward moment. She was like, huh, ho, hmm, oh no. <laughs> A dwarf and an axe bearer. Hmm. I have good will to elves, but you ask much. This is a strange friendship. Strange it may seem, said Legolas, but while Gimli lives, I shall not come to Fangorn alone. 
His axe is not for trees, but for Orknex, O Fangorn, master of Fangorn's wood. Forty-two he hewed in the battle. Yeah, then she wrote like, um, all right, I'll in that case, story. Yeah. Now that you've, you know. I can, I can feel Hugh and Orknex. Orc that, yeah. uh, that sounds good to me. Yeah, yep. Um. Sounds like they have more in common than you originally thought. That's right, that's right. Okay, um, so, uh, then we have a little bit about, uh, Treebeard's finally kind of finished adding the hobbits to the long list mm-hmm. of, of creatures, mm-hmm. of uh, beings of Middle-earth. He says, I've put their names into the long list. Ents will remember it. Ents the earthborn, old as mountains, the wide walkers, water drinking, and hungry as hunters, the hobbit, the hobbit children, the laughing folk, the little people. Hungry as hunters, the laughing folk. Yeah. It's cool that the hobbits are known as the laughing the folk. The laughing folk, yes, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a good way to be remembered. Yep. So, um... Treebeard says his goodbyes to Merry and Pippin. That's right. Um, yeah, so, and he says, Treebeard, of course, says, hey, you know, if you ever see the Ant Wives, let us know. Mm-hmm. Um... They're like, will do. Yeah. Uh, and on the subject of Saruman being imprisoned, um... Saruman remains to nurse his hatred and weave again such webs as he can. He has the key of Orthanc, but he must not be allowed to escape. Indeed, no, Ents will see to that, said Treebeard. Saruman shall not set foot beyond the rock without my leave. Ents will watch over him. Good, said Gandalf. That is what I hoped. Now I can go and turn to other matters with one care the less. But you must be wary. The waters have gone down. It will not be enough to put sentinels around the tower. I fear. I do not doubt that there were deep ways delved under Orthanc, and that Saruman hopes to go and come unmarked before long. If you will undertake the labor, I beg you to pour in the waters again and do so until Isengard remains a standing pool, or you discover the outlets. When all the underground places are drowned and the outlets blocked, then Saruman must stay upstairs and look out, out of the windows. Leave it to the Ents, said Treebeard. We shall search the valley from head to foot and peer under every pebble. Trees are coming back to live here. Old trees, wild trees. The watchwood, we will call it. Not a squirrel will go here, but I shall know of it. Leave it to Ents. Until seven times the years in which he tormented us have passed, we shall not tire of watching him. So they're basically going to like create a new forest around Isengard. Is that what they're going to do? Um, yeah, yeah, they're going to do that, but then Gandalf also wants him to create, like basically refill the pool around in the Isengard ring mm. so that if... Saruman had created any secret passageways under the right. earth that that he won't be able to escape via those. Yeah, that's a, another mystery that was solved for me when I read that. I was like, why did they flood Isengard in the first place? That didn't make sense to me. But now I understand. They had, well, they're trying to flood out the secret passageways. Well, but then there's also kind of like the uh, cleansing all the Well, filth, yeah, the baptism, right? for sure. Yeah, but I knew there had to be more to it than that. Yeah. And now I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, there you go. That was a good chapter. Yeah, really good chapter. Um, lots lot to a, talk about in it. Uh, yeah. So... Yeah, we kind of jabbered on a long time for that, didn't we? There was a lot to talk about. There was a lot to talk about. What are you looking at? Huh? I was going to, I don't know, try to get the haiku ready, maybe? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables, and haiku. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables, and haiku. Nice. Yeah. Let's just talk like this for the rest of the episode. No, it's not. For no reason at all. Okay. Never talking like this contest. <laughs> uh, what movie is that from? It's, it's from 30 Rock. It's where... That's right. Alec Baldwin. It's where Alec, you know, Alec Baldwin is on there and he always talks like this. That's right. For God's sake, Lemon. And then, uh, and then Will Arnett's character shows up in oh, one episode that's and she's right. like... And, and she says, you're going to have a talking like this contest. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, I missed that show. Yeah. That was such a good series. Um, all right. Haiku time. Yes, haiku time. You so, going first or am I? Uh, well, let's just do paper, rock, scissors. It's called rock, paper, scissors. Rock, rock paper, paper, scissors, scissors shoot. shoot. Rock, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I win! Right. I want you to go first. Okay. Saruman beaten, yet not powerless. Wizards never lack wisdom. Ooh. I like it. Yeah, well I was done. happy with that. I wrote another one last night, and I was like, this one stinks. So I wrote another one this morning. 
Are you not going to read your second one? No, it's not any good. Okay. Well, I only wrote one, and I don't know if it's any good, but I well, have go a choice but to read it. Here's mine. I'll tell you if it's horrible. Don't okay. worry. I know you will. You're always so honest. Um, here we go. Wizards duel with words. White laughs at psychedelics. Jedi mind tricks. Fool. Well, there's a lot of crazy words in there. Psychedelic. He threw psychedelic in I there. Did, psychedelic. Try read it again for me. Okay. Wizards duel with words. White laughs at psychedelics. Jedi mind tricks. Oh, Fool. Nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. Psych. Do you get the psychedelic thing? Yeah, the color. Yeah, the color. Yeah, the color for the coat of yeah. many colors. Yep. Yeah. And that's like the amazing mine. Technicolor dream coat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, you yeah, know, I had to throw in a Star Wars reference. Keep Josh, Super Fan uh, Josh happy. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. That's like my one Star Wars reference that I know. Well, well say, say the, uh, the, the <laughs> Jedi, Jedi mind, mind trick. Tricks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, they named the next Star Wars movie. You Did know, because, you know. There's another one? Yeah, there's like the. So, there, you know, because Episode 7, The Force Awakens, was the first of a new trilogy. Oh, and, right. Okay. Uh, and so episode eight, they've been filming and they just announced that it's called the last Jedi, which I think is a great title. I really like that title. I wasn't crazy about the force awakens. Um, as a title Jedi, that sounds kind of, um, ominous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. I liked, uh, I liked your haiku. Thanks. All right. Let's hear what everybody else had. All right. Let's see here. We got one from, actually we got two from Mary Grace. Mary Grace. Mary Grace. Um, I'll read her first one. You can read her second one. Right on. Flattery and praise from a dark heart, cruel and cold. Saruman, no more. Nice. Yes. Nice. Well then. The day at last comes. Alas, a Maya fallen and a duty failed. Mm, good mm-hmm. one. Very mm-hmm. nice. What is the duty failed? I think it's his duty is a... Why he was sent here in the first place, his mission. Saruman's right? mission, yeah, he failed the, in his the mission. The mission of the Astari to, um, to, to lead Middle-earth in a defense against Sauron, right? Yeah. Got it. To foil Sauron's plots. Yep. Right. So Saruman's a failure on many different levels. Yeah. Um, we, have an, we have one from Mr. Rob Fangman. Rob Also, Fangman. shout out to Rob. He was... Rob, you know, the man, the myth, the legend. Yeah, Fangman. Rob, the man, the myth, the legend. He was the one that chose... Bananas. You know, I asked him, just word. FYI, I asked him about his last name a while back, and he said it's uh, Fangman. It rhymes with Hangman. I like saying it Fangman. Okay, you can if you want. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can say it all Middle Earth style if you want to. I want to. So, shoot me. All right. Um, but as I was saying, Rob chose the word bananas, wrote uh-huh. a secret word last week. So, yes. shout out to him for choosing a super fun, out-of-the-box secret mm-hmm. word. Um, and now for his haiku for this week. A battle of wills. Gandalf comes out the greater. Saruman slinks off. Mm. That slinky Saruman. Slink. You know, it's funny. I almost thought of using the word slink. Did you? And I Actually, in my other other haiku, I was toying oh, with yeah. you. I used sinks, but I was toying with it. I was like, because I feel like slinking should be in here somewhere. Yeah. So it's funny that uh, we, were both, Rob we were both been, thinking uh, slinky thoughts. Kind of a kind of a mystery how that worked out. That is kind of a mystery. Yeah. You know what song I think of? What, what? song has been running through my head this entire episode? Oh, uh, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say mm-hmm. um, Why don't you pull it Fight up Test. Right now? Yes! Pull it up. We need to play it. Sorry. Brief brief respite from the haiku. I had it pulled up earlier, but I'm not on Wi-Fi, so I didn't want to play it. Here it is. Yep. I thought I Dang, saw you. I love that song. I do too. I thought I saw you pulling up um, the the that cover earlier yep, on your phone, I and I was like, mm-hmm. "Why are you pulling up Flaming Lips?" Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, but then now I understand. Why now you're pulling you it understand. Up. It's not a mystery it's anymore. No longer is it a mystery to me. I mean, I just I love that song. Yeah. So much. It's a great song. I could listen to it but over you, and over. You, you know the the one thing about it is um, they got they got sued by Cat Stevens because. Uh, I think I've told you this before. But, oh, maybe you have. Um, he's got a song that where the melody sounds a whole lot like it, and I'm not a big fan of the whole like musicians suing each other because you stole my song or something like that. What you song my... is it? Um, let's see. I think it's Father and Son. So wait, so Cat Stevens. Kind of changes there. I, I don't know. Like I feel like there's there's nothing new under the sun. Like it's like seriously like yeah. 
really, Cat Stevens? Did you really have to? Yeah. Like, did you really need more money? Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, exactly. He just wanted the credit, probably. And I just have a hard time thinking that, like, Flamey Lips sat down and they were like, uh, let's steal Cat Stevens' father and son for this song and turn it into our own song. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe they did. But I'm just saying, I think that's... I think that's pretty lame. That and it happens yeah. all the time. Like it does. You well, know? you got you got like a right. The Ghostbusters theme song is totally "I Want a New Drug" by Huey Lewis, right? I mean, yeah. And I'm not saying it hasn't happened deliberately in the past. Yeah. But I don't know. And I think I don't know. I think they probably you know settled out of court, but it just um, yeah, it's kind of annoying. annoying. Yeah. But you know what? It doesn't take anything away from Fight Test for me. Oh no, I that love that song. That is like the perfect song for this chapter. I, it's about a fight. That's one of my favorite. Right? Like I, I love that song, Fight Test. It's, it's amazing. Uh, like I could, tw- I seriously could listen to it over and over. And lyrics, over. everything. Like it, and you know, it's Flaming Lips, so it's got that like kind of weird sense of humor in it as well. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. It's got the cool kind of like, you know, like psychedelic. Yeah. Like, entrance and exit. It's so great. Yeah, that's I great. Love it. Classic I love song. It, it is classic. classic. Go um, listen to the whole thing if you haven't ever listened to it. By the way. Yes. Flaming Lips, Fight Test. Yeah. It'll change your world. Yeah, the whole album is a pretty great album. Yoshimi Battles. Pink yes, Robots. Yoshimi. That's a good one, too. Flaming Lips. They still tour. Yeah, I think they just put out another album. Oh, for real. I wonder if they're going to Nashville. I saw them back in the day. I saw them of back in... Of course you did. You saw everybody who I want to see. Actually, when they were on tour for the album before this, mm. which is a pretty good album, too. Soft Bowl with him. How old were you? I was in college. I think it was when I was home from uh, college one summer. You didn't take like me with you. I was step. no, I, I don't, I don't think we were dating yet. Oh, we. I hope, I hope that's true. Because if I yeah. find out that it's not, I'm not gonna be happy. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we weren't, we weren't dating yet. Okay. Well, I think it was after my freshman year. At least when you went to see you two, you brought me a T-shirt. That's right. So that was pretty awesome. Right, this conversation is getting very personal. It is getting very right. personal. <laughs> 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 Apologies. Um, that's what Flaming Lips does to me. You know, they like put me in like my safe space. Okay. So back to Haiku World, uh, Aaron the Reason, Tyson, he uh, sent us Haiku, and here it is. Cast from the order, staff broken, color and stone lost. Not a good day. Right on. And he spelled color with a U. Boom. Boom. That's like the coolest thing is about he, the Canadian cultural. Is he Canadian? Cultural. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, he is Canadian. Okay. Yeah. Kalur. Whenever I see it spelled like that, I want to say Kalur. Kalur. Yeah, I want to well, say Aaron it like and I had this kind of interesting color. This, um, <laughs> I know, you shared that with us last time. Well, yeah, but then I said that I also, I like when people add use to the to words, and that I also like when theater is spelled. Theatre? The, yeah, with the R and the E. You know, R-E instead of E-R. Theatre. Theatre. That's how I say it. And he it. said that they, uh, they, they spell theater that way as well, with an R-E. So I'm thinking maybe I might need to move to Canada. I think they're, just, they're just a little more classy up there. They're, you they're know? very classy. Um, I just think it would be too cold for me. Yeah. Um, Got to go in the summer. I bet it's gorgeous in the summer. It, uh, it's probably not. Yeah, it's probably not bad. I would really like to go to... Um, British Columbia. Vancouver. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to go to uh, Anna Green Gables World. Oh, no, that's Prince Edward Island. That's what I meant that's to That's the say. other side. That's the exact opposite... Wait, what did you say? I said Vancouver. Oh, well, I've been to Victoria. Yeah, that's true. So that's pretty much similar. Yeah, Prince Edward Island, you're right. Opposite coast. Right. All right. Um, all right. So we have three, actually, from Matt Scarens, and we have three from Josh. Cool. Um, Dang. so I'll read, um, you know, I'll let you read two of Matt's. Let's we'll just go back and forth. We'll just trade we'll back, go back and, forth. and forth. Okay. So here we go. Matt's first haiku. Like and yet unlike. So similar, these wizards. Yet so different. Nice. Yes. I think that's a play off of what Gimli said, right? Like and yet unlike. It is. Right. He has it in quotes, so I think it... Yeah. Yeah. Second uh, haiku for Matt. A white light broken. Saruman has left the path. Still Gandalf has hope. Nice. That is good. That's really good. Mm-hmm. Number three. A strange parting gift. The serpent now scolds the worm. And Tookish heart awakes. Nice. Tookish heart. Per- uh, Pippin. Ah, nice. Oh, wait. That was the third one. Um, 
yeah, so, you know, Pippin is auto, is drawn to the Palantir when it's thrown out of the window, right? So that's his heart awaking. It took his heart awake. Oh, got it. That makes sense. Well done, Matt. Thank you. And we have three from Josh. And um, he says he has since soothed himself. He's back into haiku. He's he's back into writing uh, mind blowing haikus because right. he's he's on he's got his paper off uh, to a good start. Nice. Okay, haiku one from uh, Super, fan, Super Josh. fan Josh. A chapter unfolds of one Cyrenian voice, Odysseus esque. Odysseus esque. No, it says Odysseus esque. Oh, you're right, Odysseus esque. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, he's referring to Odysseus. He's referring yes. to the Odyssey, the sirens from the Odyssey, not to the character Odysseus. He's referring to right to the, the sirens from the I Odyssey. Love the Odyssey, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love the Odyssey. It's a great story. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, number two from Superfan Josh, Mayar of Aule, crafty with words, not with hands, yet crafts his demise. Nice. Yep. Awesome. Hmm. It's interesting. I, I I've forgotten that uh, Saruman was the Maya of Al, was the Maya of Ale. Um, was a Maya of Ale. Um, so wait, does that mean that Ale? Which that's interesting. Created because, him? No. What does that mean? I think I think um, which is interesting because I think Sauron was also a Maya of Ale Ale originally. Sauron was. Yeah. But what does that mean to be a Maya of somebody? It just means he like um, you know the the Valar. Were there were only a handful of Valar, right? But there were many Maiar. Yeah. So it was kind of like they, that was their like their almost like their tribe, you know, like, it's like their it was who system. he learned from, and um, you know, it's kind of like what he specialized in was were the things that Ale were good at was uh, good at, right? Okay. So like Ulmo, who was the Valar of the waters, right? Right. Um, he had like control over all the waters of the world, right? Yes. But uh, he had um. Was it Ose? I think was um, Ose was was one oh, of his yeah. Maiar. Yeah, and Ose I think had like he either had control of the of like the coastlands or like of the or of the sea or he didn't have control of all the waters. He just had like control of a specific type of waters, right? Okay. Okay, so that's the that's. The I idea see there. what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Okay. All right. Um. So it's it's just interesting that that Ale was the Maiar of both Sauron and Saruman. Yeah, and something's wrong with Ale, yo. And going to making the dwarves, and I yeah, was thinking, I know, and then right? the, the, the Saruman's words not having any effect on Gimli, mm. and Gimli, you know, the dwarves being made by Ale. Yeah, and... that's a good point. Anyway, just interesting yeah, connections that is interesting. there. Um, haiku three. The fang of cunning was shattered at Dream's command. Now he has put. Now he has but speech. Nice. Nice. Dang. Well done. Our listeners are pretty great haiku writers. They are. Mm, Man. Good stuff. Good, awesome good, sauce. good stuff. All right, well, I think that is a wrap on this episode. Any more haiku? Well, I hope so. It's been long enough. Yeah. Well, um, someone wanted to talk about, uh, you know, the whole justice and mercy thing. Hey, that was a worthwhile conversation. Oh, I know. I'm just saying. You said it was took long enough. And yeah. then... I was just saying, well, not my fault. You wanted to talk about it. Which mm-hmm. I was like, well, you talk, talk about, about it. it. So it is your fault for falling into my trap. Very well. Mm-hmm. I blame you for everything. I blame you for everything. All right. Haiku for Chapter 11 due on uh, February 1st. Uh, so get them in by then. And um, and then thanks again to our patrons. Yes. Shannon thank you, Stockbridge, guys. Stockbridge, Josh Sosa, William Hutton, Brian Orr, Margaret Lyon, Emilio Perea, Zeke Farmer, Caleb Santana, and James Applegate. You guys are rock stars. Thank you. Total rock stars. Yes. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Yes, thank you. And um, we got our uh, top three things about this chapter going up as our uh, as our video for this week over at uh, patreon.com slash Tolkien Road or Tolkien Road.com. So. so if you want to see it and you haven't already become a patron, become a patron. Or, you know, go over and watch some of the old videos that are free and then you can decide if you want to become and a patron. you'll see how awesome they are and you'll want yeah. to be... A patron. Right on. So you can see all the others. Right on. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Greta. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yes, thanks, guys. We shall talk at you next time. Yes. Be here.
Bye bye. Bye y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org and tolkienroad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll continue our discussion of Book 3 with Chapter 11, The Palantir. If you'd like to submit haiku for that episode, please send them to tolkienroadpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.